I'd like to begin by thanking Alan Sherman, who is the instigator of this project to insert a two-week module on quantum computing in our graduate course in quantum algorithms. And I'd also like to take, uh, thank Mark for his uh, brilliant lecture from Edinburgh. And uh, I'd like to begin, a subject I'd like to talk about is what is quantum computing? And this is a most amazing field. Uh, essentially, quantum computing is the collision of many different disciplines. Uh, we have computer science, which is definitely part of the discipline, and physics are coming in, and math is coming in, uh, electrical engineering, and almost every discipline you can think of is somehow involved. This is a multidisciplinary area, and it requires a computer scientist to know um, many different fields at the same time, and in a certain sense, we would like to have Renaissance computer scientists work on quantum computing. Of course, the big question is, why bother? Quantum computation, uh, basically, what's happening now is the limits of small-scale integration technology uh, is to be reached uh, sometime before 2025, if not sooner. This means many things. It means that no longer will Moore's Law um, mean that every 1.5 years will double the computing power at half the price. Um, on the positive side, that means that keep your quantum computers, they'll have better resale value in the future. Uh, a whole new industry is about to be built around the new and emerging quantum technology. This is an exciting time. So what's the promise of quantum computing? Okay. The promise of quantum computing. Uh, Moore's law has been uh, essentially almost doubling the computing power every um, year and a half um, for half the price and um, um, half the size. This law is soon to, uh, to end and um, what we're hoping is that a new curve will appear on the horizon, the uh, exponential curve of quantum speed up. Uh, this is a, a leap to a much faster computing domain. We're trying to leap to what appears to be an extraordinary faster uh, computing world. What can we do with this speed up? Well, uh, the only limit at this time is our imagination. Uh, break unbreakable crypto codes. Uh, accurate weather simulation and prediction, at least we'll be able to push the envelope further. Uh, simulations of viruses, this might lead to amazing medical discoveries, and who knows what is to come. It's impossible to predict. It has many different advantages. But on the other hand, um, there is a fundamental question. What are the limits and boundaries of quantum computing? Uh, will future quantum computers be general purpose or special purpose devices? We've discussed superposition, measurement, unitary evolution, and quantum entanglement. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, uh, you know, we stir this mixture up and somehow we start producing quantum algorithms. Okay. Before I do that, what I'd like to do is to show you an application of quantum, uh, how quantum entanglement can be used. Um, so here is an application. Uh, initially, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen tried to get rid of the concept of entanglement, and we, we now realize that we can't uh, get rid of it. It's actually an essential part of quantum mechanics, and so why not use it? And this leads us to the concept of quantum teleportation. And of course, um, before I can talk about teleportation, uh, we need to know what teleportation means, and so I'll go to the World Authority, the Oxford Unabridged Dictionary. 
and look up the definition of teleportation. What is teleportation? Teleportation means transferring an object from two locations by a process of dissociation to obtain information, to destroy the object as you are scanning it, uh, scan to extract sufficient information to recreate original. That information is transmitted by classical means to a new location, and at that new location, it's reconstructed from the information. Each replica is reassembled at the destination out of locally available material. Net effect is destruction of the original object and creation of the exact replica of and at the intended destination. This is what is meant by uh, teleportation. And we can use quantum mechanics to actually teleport objects. This has been done in the quantum physics labs. And uh, of course, uh, Scotty has something to say about teleportation. And um, unfortunately, he's busy. I went to see Scotty and he asked me, I asked him about teleportation. He said he was very busy. And, uh, but he did graciously loan me a copy of uh, his teleportation manual. And I'd like to share that with you now. OK, here is the quantum teleportation manual. I apologize. It's been used so much, it's a little dog-eared, but that's OK. Uh, step one of the teleportation manual it takes place at location A. At location A, we construct an EPR pair of qubits qubits number two and number three, living in their separate Hilbert spaces, H2 and H3, and living collectively in H2 tensor H3. And we use, to do so, we use a unitary transformation. And later in the course, we'll show you how to do this. Uh, the next thing we do, step to set up our teleportation, is physically transport the right qubit to from location A to location B, leaving the left qubit, qubit A, at location A. So now we have location A and B share EPR pair. Qubit 2 is at location A. Qubit 3 is at location B. Qubits 2 and 3 are still entangled, although they are separated. The state of all three qubits, of course, we bring in a qubit. Perhaps someone knocks on our door with a box and asks us to uh, teleport a qubit. And what's shown here is qubit number one, A cat zero, B cat one. So the total state of all three qubits is as shown, living in the tensor product of Hilbert spaces. OK, and um, what's next? So the, in summary, the current state of all three qubits is uh, as shown here. And what we're going to do is we're going to change our basis. Um, this is what is known as a Bell basis. This is a basis of H1 tensor H2. And it is here as shown. It's a very famous basis. has can be used in many different ways. All right, let's take a look at that. And what we'll do is we'll apply, uh, we'll rewrite everything in, new, in a new basis really don't have to do this as a simpler way of discussing this. We'll do that later in the course when we learn more. We re-express the qubits in terms of the Bell basis. And we end up with an expression that looks like, like the following, as so shown on the screen. The next thing we do is um, we apply a unitary transformation, which transforms the Bell basis into the standard basis. Here's the standard basis, just the ket zero, uh, the ket's labeled by um, bits. And in so doing, the resulting state is the following. Uh, at this point, um, we, uh, we, what we'll do is we'll take a measurement of qubits 1 and 2. We'll simply measure qubits 1 and 2. 
uh, produces two bits of information. And we send these two bits of information to the uh, location B. Could be Alpha Centauri uh, to uh, the qubit um, held by the other part of the EPR pair at location B. And in summary, we have as a result the unknown qubit number one has been disassembled and the information read two classical bits is sent to location B which contain what's left of the, uh, the half of the EPR pair, one qubit. Based on this information, the um, person at location B, I guess I should call him Bob, um, Bob reads the information and from a table chooses a unitary transformation which uh, if the bits received are for instance 0, 1, it tells him that what he has now has in hand is, um, uh, is a state, a qubit, and the state minus a cat 0 plus minus b cat 1. So he applies a unitary transformation to put it into the original state. If he receives uh, 1, 1 as the received information, he knows the state is as the form so indicated as shown by my cursor. And he applies a unitary transformation to put it into the original state. End result is um, he applies, well, he does apply a selected unitary transformation to qubit number three, and the result is the following. Qubit number three now has the original state that was at location A, and qubit number one now has, um, uh, has been disassembled, destroyed. So the no cloning theorem has not been violated. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, to some other subjects. We've talked about teleportation. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about quantum algorithms and um, quantum algorithms in general. Next I'd like to talk about, the, just reiterate some facts about the quantum world and quantum algorithms. The quantum world. We have quantum states as we know in summary and they exist in superposition and um, there we can take this superposition and apply a unitary evolution to that. We could also perform measurements where appears to be a sudden jump in the state of the system and finally uh, we can all use this to create a special type of superposition called quantum entanglement. If we take all these concepts involved what we can do is start creating quantum algorithms. And let's start the game. Quantum algorithms, or maybe I should just mention or show you the quantum zoo. Uh, today we have many algorithms, some of which are not shown in these slides. The field is moving very rapidly. We have quantum simulation algorithms of quantum sim systems. We have quantum algorithms, the first quantum algorithm was the deutsch josa algorithm. We'll take a look at that. Um, after that, deutsch josas algorithm was generalized into Simon's algorithm. We'll take a look at that algorithm. And finally, in that sequence of events, Simon's algorithm was extended into what the, the famous Shor's factoring algorithms for integers in exactly that sequence. This is a family of algorithms called quantum hidden subgroup algorithms. And some of these give exponential speed ups. Um, we're for sure, Simon's algorithm, we're not, we're not sure about Shor's, uh, but very good indication that it does. Soon after this sequence of algorithms um, took place, someone else came along, Love Grover, and he invented the famous Grover uh, algorithm for searching an unstructured list in uh, quadra quadratically faster than can be done classically. These are called amplit amplitude amplification algorithms and these do provide a quadratic speed up in time. 
Uh, these two algorithms actually are related. I've written a paper in that regard. Uh, I'd like to mention another class of algorithms, quantum random walks. Um, classical random walks are well studied. Um, essentially a random walk is a, a drunkard moving away from a, a light post. Um, if you were a quantum uh, drunkard, he'd move in an entirely different fashion. Uh, these are not, and these quantum random walks in, uh, illustrate non-classical behavior. And there's also a class of algorithms called adiabatic algorithms based on physics, the adiabatic principle. And uh, there's a lot of work going in that area. There's also um, algorithms for computing like the Jones polynomial and so forth. But let me move on. These are called trace estimation algorithms, and that will later lead us into phase estimation, another way of understanding Shor's algorithm. Uh, let me begin by showing you the, the first quantum algorithm ever invented. It was invented by David Deutsch, a student of John Wheeler. It's and now called the uh, Deutsch, and Joza added uh, basing in addition to the algorithm, but basically it's the Deutsch's algorithm. Um, definition, let me begin. I'd like to define the algorithm. Uh, a coin is said to be fair or balanced if it has heads on one side and tails on the other side. It is unfair or constant if either it has tails on both sides are heads on both sides. You can get those uh, coins at magic stores if you like. So here we have um, a fair um, coin. It's heads on one side, heads on another side, or if you like another one, it's heads on side one and uh, tails on side one and heads on side two. Uh, Here is one unfair coin, tails on both sides, another unfair coin, uh, heads on both sides. Observation. In the classical world, we need to observe both sides of the coin to determine whether or not it's fair. Someone hands you a coin, uh, you have to turn it all over to find out whether or not it's a fair coin. Obvious fact. However, this isn't exactly true in the quantum world. We can make one single observation to decide if the coin is fair or not. What we need to do to understand this algorithm and define it is to represent a coin mathematically as a Boolean function. In computer science, we encounter Boolean functions all the time. So we can think of a coin as simply a map from 0, 1 to 0, 1. And of course, side 1 of the coin is uh, 0, denoted by 0, and side 2 is denoted by 2. And, uh, and since the coin uh, heads is what's on side 1, and tails is what is on side 2. So a coin is modeled mathematically as a Boolean function. Now we'd like to create a unitary transformation. Let uf be the unitary transformation, which does the following. Uh, it takes the, the Hilbert space of two qubits to the Hilbert space of two qubits. It has um, ket x and ket, ket y. Those are qubit states. It takes that to ket x and actually computes the function which defines the coin f of x. and adds it to y mod 2. The plus with a circle means addition mod 2. And we can create a unitary transformation which actually does this. Then, um, here's our unitary transformation. Um, so if we input ket x uh, and the first uh, for x, and for y we input the superposition of 0 and 1 as so shown, the interesting thing comes out of this computation, if we apply the unitary transformation, the phase is actually the value of the coin, is the function 
f of x. And you'll notice that something else has happened. Um, this computation has not changed um, ket0, the second qubit. It's actually ca uh, called an ancilla qubit. It's borrowed from the bank, you might say, uh, used for the computation, and then returned uh, untarnished and in the same shape it was in before, but it was used to actually put the state of the system in this form where we put all the information into the phase of the state of the qubit. Moreover, let us apply the Hadamard transforms on both sides of this unitary transformation. And you can actually find out that the resulting unitary transformation produces um, the following state, as so indicated. If you look closely at that, and let's do, look at the result of this. If you measure uh, the first qubit state, uh, if f is a fair coin, then that means that f of 0 and f of 1 are different. So this, one of these is plus and one is minus. This disappears. And the end result, and this, um, uh, this is the sum of two ones. is either minus 1 or minus 2, the whole expression. So the result, if it's fair, the output will simply be 1. Right? 0 times this plus the other, which is actually, um, since these are different, either plus or minus 1. And um, if we look at case 2, f is, if f is unfair, then what happens? Um, we'll notice that the amplitude of um, the first uh, ket 0, ket 1 is actually plus or minus 1 because these two are the same. And if we measure this, we'll get ket 0. So the end result is that if we measure the first qubit, we either get 1 or 0, which tells us whether or not the coin is fair or not. So if we only make one observation, that, and that we have, if we observe the left register, then we can determine whether or not f is fair or unfair. But where is my quantum computer? I mean, uh, I'm talking about quantum computers, and uh, uh, why can't you buy one at the local computer store? Uh, currently, small quantum computers have already been built and have been demonstrated to work uh, by uh, running Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm. Uh, but building quantum computers is not the real problem in a certain sense. The real, the real problem is to build a quantum computer that is scalable. Uh, and a major obstacle to doing this is what we will call decoherence. This is the major problem. I should mention that we factored, uh, in Shor's algorithm, we've actually factored 21, I believe, maybe also 15, very small integers, nowhere near factoring big numbers. And the major obstacle to quantum computing is decoherence. And, um, and of course, what is decoherence? Well, let's see if we can see what decoherence is. Why is it so hard to build a quantum computer? A quantum system uh, simply doesn't want to be isolated, uh, but instead wants to be entangled with, with its environment as well as with itself. So there are arbitrary unitary transformations that take place that we have no control over, or we're trying to control, that entangle our computer system with the rest of the world and within itself that can't be controlled. We call this decoherence. Uh, the more a quantum system entangles with the environment and itself, the more to one observing only the system without looking at the rest of the world, uh, it will appear to be noisy and classical. It's actually an entangled pure state, but since we're only looking at part of it, it appears to be noisy and classical. It's said to lose its coherence. 
and hence it's uncontrollable. Uh, by this process, qubits appear to the observer to be degenerating into random classical bits. But in actuality, and uh, quantum mechanics says that they are part of a pure state, we're only observing part of the uh, pure state and uh, part of an entangled state. We call this phenomena decoherence. And uh, so we have a quantum system, and it lives in a quantum environment. And uh, we try to isolate it, but it's very hard. It starts to entangle uh, by random unitary transformations that are totally out of our control. And if we observe the system, we see something that's actually classical. Now what I'd like to do is go into a little more depth into Dirac notation. Uh, if you recall, we talked about bras and kets and, and the bracket. Uh, let's take a little closer look at that. Now, unsaid before, a bracket is really uh, a bra, excuse me, is a, a very special kind of vector. It's actually a vector which is a linear map from the Hilbert space into the complex numbers. And we denote this, this Hilbert space of linear maps with the H star. And it's really a Hilbert space of linear transformations from H into C. And of course, we call these linear transformation bra uh, bras and, uh, and denote them in this location. A uh, left delimiter, which is a, uh, a less than sign and a right delimiter or vertical bar, a label inside which simply designates the bra. The, the bra. Uh, there is a dual correspondence between bras and kets that is important to mention. There's a duality here. We have kets on the, in one Hilbert space, bras in the other Hilbert space, and they're very much related to one another. And if we compose them, as we saw, we got the bracket product, which is a complex number, and which is simply uh, abbreviated uh, in the fashion so indicated. We have the, on the left the bra and the ket. We've seen a lot of that before, but the important thing to remember here is that the bra is actually a linear transformation, and it's a vector space of linear transformations. And uh, this is our bracket notation. We can think of bras, we can represent these linear transformations as row vectors over the complex numbers. Let H be a two-dimensional Hilbert space with orthonormal basis ket0 and ket1. And let uh, H star be our Hilbert space of bras, of linear transformations into, uh, from H into the complex numbers. And we, uh, as before, we use the same notation. Uh, same delimiters as before to get bra 0 and bra 1. We can think of bra 0 as a row vector, uh, 1, 0, and 1 as a row vector. And in this way, writing, uh, we can write the bra, which consists of uh, bra 0a, uh, bra 1b, uh, as simply a row vector of complex numbers. Bras and kets are actually adjoint to one another. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a dual correspondence. On the one side, we have a complex number, a ket, which is a column vector AB. And we have the, as mentioned before, the adjoint operator, the conjugate transform, which transforms a ket into a bra by simply performing conjugation and transposition. And as I mentioned before, this is an adjoint operator. So uh, let's let H be our two-dimensional Hilbert space. 
with orth orthonormal bases ket0 and ket1. And then uh, we create another uh, Hilbert space, the uh, um, h star, which is uh, the vector space is where the vectors now are linear transformations from the uh, original Hilbert space of kets into the complex numbers, and we call uh, those bras. And these can be thought of as um, row vectors of complex numbers, as I've, uh, as I have mentioned. Bras and kets as adjoint uh, to one another. There's an adjoint operator, which is conjugate transport uh, transformation um, operator, which transforms uh, uh, kets, which are column vectors, into row vectors, which are bras, and it simply transposes and conjugates. That's it. There's a combination. So let's look at our two kets. In forming the bra, we actually perform the transpose and complex conjugate and perform the resulting matrix multiplication produce the bracket product. There's another way of thinking about uh, bras and kets or another product. We mentioned the, the uh, bracket product but we can reverse the order of the product and produce what is known as the matrix outer product. If we have two kets, ket psi 1 and ket psi 2. Uh, we can take ket psi 1 times bra psi 2 to produce a linear transformation. And what this does is it takes ket psi to ket psi, uh, um, ket psi 1 times the bracket of psi 2 and psi 1. All right, so it matches each, excuse me, what this does is it takes each ket in the Hilbert space H to a new ket. And that ket is formed by first applying the, the bra, which is a linear transformation. It maps it to a complex number, which is the bracket. And, um, and that complex number times psi 1, uh, which when written in matrix notation becomes what, is I, what I've called before the outer product, which is simply uh, um, matrix multiplication. So let's let H be the, uh, an n-dimensional space, Hilbert space, with the orthonormal basis so indicated. And we'll use the convention the matrix is, uh, is indexed in such a way that the indices begin with zero. Then the matrix of the linear transformation, which is the outer product of ket m with bra k, is an n by n matrix consisting of all zeros with the exception of entry mk, which is 1. For example, for n equal to 4, um, ket 2 times ket 3 is a matrix with 1 in entry 2, 3 and zeros everywhere else. This is a very useful notation, entry 2, 3. 